There we go. I don't know why I decided to change that. <clears throat> Let me start that again. Uh, welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory. We are uh, on Varietal Literature's YouTube channel, and if you've never been here before, or if you were here on the Thursday show where we do a ride along live, what we do here on Tuesday nights, Fairy Tale Tuesday, is we read old folklore and fairy tales uh, with a little bit of a backtrack, sometimes some sound effects, and performances by moi. Um, <clears throat> thank you, GS, for letting me know that I could have done the entire show and not realized that. Uh, what we're talking about tonight, though, is dogs. Specifically, we're talking about supernatural dogs and how they appear in German folklore is what we're going to focus on. Dogs have a little bit of a diverse uh, representation in various areas of folklore. Sometimes they just don't come up. In some areas, they're fairly big. Um, usually, they're not regarded as friendly as we do now with dogs, which makes sense because in those times it was probably more likely you would find wild or feral dogs that are not particularly kind. <clears throat> so uh, if you've never been to this show before, you should know that if you're not watching this live, down in the description below, there will be timestamps for each of the stories we're going to read tonight. And there are quite a few stories that we're going to read tonight. Most of them are very short. One, The last one will be a little bit longer and meatier. But in total, we plan to read nine stories tonight. Some of those actually are a little short paragraphs. Some are a little longer. And they all concern supernatural dogs. So if you just want to get to those things, check in the description below. Click on the timestamps. Go to whatever interests you. Uh, the way I'm going to start out tonight, though, is I'm going to answer probably some questions you have in your mind about the stories that we're going to tell. And one of them is, why poodles? <laughs> now, you don't may not know this yet. But most of what we're going to read tonight is from a collection of translations of German folklore from a contemporary modern translator, Jürgen Hubert, who often comments on these videos, and we'll see some comments from him later as well. Um, and the name of that collection and his Patreon, which you should support, is Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles. And for the months I've been reading from it, which I guess is since December... Um, I get the question now and then, why evil poodles? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it's poodles and give you a bit of a frame for the stories. But if you don't care about any of that and you're not watching this live, go down to the description below and jump ahead to the first story. <clears throat> uh, so why poodles? Well, if you don't know, and I used to be a part of uh, a thing called a junior kennel club. So the consequence of that was you showed dogs, but you also spent a bunch of time with people that really loved and knew too much about dogs. Uh, and one of the things that you, a few things that are, I think, relevant about poodles is uh, they are a water dog. And water dogs obviously were very handy for hunting and so on. Kind of every area of Europe had its own water dog. And unsurprisingly, the water dog that was probably most prominent, especially in medieval Germany, was the poodle. Now, standard poodles are full-sized dogs. So if you're thinking in your head of a miniature poodle, which is probably the more modern, silly representation of them, that's not what's being referenced here. But even if you're thinking of a modern standard poodle, which has a tight, usually black curled hair, um, that's not really accurate to how a poodle used to look either. Poodles used to be a lot shaggier. They had a bit of curl to them. We know this from wood prints and so on. Um, so, you know, this is sort of more of a shaggy large dog that was good in the water and good with helping hunters and so on. The other thing, though, that is kind of, I think, relevant about poodles, anybody who's spent any time around poodles, um, is poodles, standard poodles, are brilliant, creepy smart, uh, like having a child. <laughs> um, and I think given that what we'll see is uh, standard poodles being likened to forms of the devil, <laughs> might have something to do with the fact that poodles were quite intelligent. And so, um, I mean, this is pure speculation on my part, but that cleverness might be interpreted as possession by a smart spirit. So... Um, we're 
going to talk about dogs, the majority of which are unnamed in their breed, but the ones that are named are poodles. And you can kind of assume, given the regions this is coming from and the eras they're coming from, that they're probably poodles. <laughs> um, poodles were pretty common, but not necessarily. And we're going to see dogs basically as representations of the devil, of ghosts, and sometimes of things bizarre. Truly some of the most unexplained and strange stories are in tonight's show. <clears throat> if you're not in the mood, uh, by the way, for short snippets of folklore and urban legends, which is how we're going to open, that's what our first few stories are, uh, the last story of the night will be the longest story of the night and the most traditionally structured. As per usual, um, because I have been getting a lot of new viewers lately, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Uh, just a warning, the folklore is not fairy tales, though they do share some, you know, corners of the bedroom together. Uh, they are not the same. And if you're coming in with the assumption that A, this is going to have morals for kids, or B, even be particularly suitable for kids, I, I would encourage you to watch it without kids first and make that decision for yourself. Uh, because folklore was not necessarily made for kids, nor was it necessarily aimed to tell a moral or even a sensible story. They're just kind of entertaining bar tales and urban legends a lot of the time. Some of them are quite violent. Some of them are quite disturbing and strange. So I don't specifically make this show for kids, but I, I can understand why a person might want to show them it. Just a heads up. This isn't necessarily kid-friendly content. But I don't aim to be specifically unfriendly. <clears throat> Hello, GS. Um, GS, what is your favorite type of dog? Your regular visitor there. And if you are out there, tell me what your favorite kind of dog is. And whether you believe it might just be the devil in another form. <clears throat> so. Um, <coughs> let me get a drink of water. I'm going to be coughing a bit today uh, because I am trying to, as I said, a mastodon, summon the were Scott that haunts my blood. And I went on a two hour walk listening to the Corys, which by the end, as as you would expect, I was ranting about how King Edward II was going to ruin my land. And then someone reminded me I was in Canada in the 21st century. Um, but uh, that long of a walk has dried my throat out a bit. So we'll see how it goes. So our first story of the night is called the Black Poodle. There's that poodle. They will always be black, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the Black Poodle in the Haslin Forest. This story comes to us from a collection of translations recently translated from German by Jürgen Hubert. In many cases, I am the first person to be reading it in English to my knowledge um <clears throat> and uh jürgen has a patreon which you can uh, support in the pinned comment below if you're not watching this live the haslin forest near hudingen where a number of the alemonic graves can be found is a haunted by a spirit this spirit appears in the form of a black poodle that leads people astray. Whoever enters the forest in the evening will not be able to escape it all night, for they will always follow the poodle who jumps back and forth before them. Only when the day breaks will the wanderer find the way out. For this reason, many people avoid this path during nighttime and prefer to walk along the wronger route of the country road. That's our first story. You see what I mean? Like some are quite short. If you're unfamiliar with folklore, this is how they sometimes go. Um, but what we can glean from this is the first of like a black poodle that doesn't really seem to have a clear purpose, but shows up and wanders along with you. <clears throat> And uh, as Jürgen 
points out in his commentary, by the way, this is basically a poodle as a will-o'-wisp, which is sort of leads people, well, it's specifically will-o'-wisps lead people out into swamps, typically. Uh, they're common in uh, Cornish and Irish and you know, all those sort of related family of stories. Apparently common to lead the drunks to their death in their little balls of light. Depending on what tradition it's from, too, it'll have different explanations of what it's doing or why. <clears throat> our next story is continuing with our poodles. So explicitly poodles. <laughs> explicitly poodles is a word I never thought I'd say, a phrase I never thought I'd say on this show. Which is the ghostly poodle. Again, this story comes from Jürgen Hubert's translations, Sunken Castles evil poodles <clears throat> disguised as a black poodle a student in Würzburg once terrorized the shield guard at the Typhastor gate for several nights between 11 and 12 o'clock however he was eventually <laughs> shot dead by the guard and now as an eternal punishment or his joking. He must haunt that gate in the form of a black poodle during the same hour of the night forevermore. Also, credit to uh, translators for helping us out here. Uh, the Typhistor means Devil's Gate, if Google is to be tra trusted on this point. Um, but, uh, you know, Jürgen is kind enough to us English speakers to add gate in English on the end there. Even though gate is already in the word. Okay, continuing on with our short little tales of um, dogs. We're going to go to, specifically poodles, we're going to go to the ghostly dog. Now the ghostly dog requires a little more atmosphere, I think. So let's get a little bit of light rain. Take down our music just slightly. Just because I find this one a little eerie. Our next tale is the ghostly dog, also from Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles, a collection of translations by Jürgen Hubert. At the first boundary stone on the road, <clears throat> from Wittwimmersbach to Diesberg, a black poodle frequently approaches travelers then silently trots along with them. As it travels, its fur gradually brightens, and at the second boundary stone, it becomes completely white. But from then on, its shade darkens once more until it is completely black again. <clears throat> at the limits of the forest, as the traveler reaches the third boundary stone. If it is left of the forest, if it is left alone, it does not harm the traveler. But if it is asked what it wants, it transforms into a dreadful giant and gives the curious person a mighty slap on the face and then it vanishes how this ghost can be released is just as, as no unknown as why it haunts that road that's our last one that's explicitly about poodles but again i think we can oh actually i think this next one has 
an explicit reference to poodles too, but <clears throat> eventually it becomes more just dogs, which again, you can largely assume are most likely poodles, but not necessarily. It's not like Germany didn't have other dogs. <clears throat> this is the first one where we get a bit of a story on it. So what is perhaps curious about the first three accounts is they're just accounts of these strange dogs. You don't know why they're there. You don't know what they want. They have strange and obscure rules, which we'll see come up again. But sometimes we do get the story. And in the case of the, the, the ghostly poodle, I think is the one it's this kid was, was playing around with the guards at the gate and got himself shot. Now he's doomed because he was, you know, screwing around with authority, right? This next one concerns the punishments for blasphemy, which is a common trope in German lore. <clears throat> so this tale is called The Lordly Dog. And it comes from a collection of translations, again, by Jürgen Hubert, called Sunken Castles, Evil Poodle. There used to be a chapel close. Let's double check if I pronounced it. To Brynamore, the chieftains of Bacamore were the patrons of this chapel, and in that it they listened to sermons and submitted to the rite of confession. However, at one time, one of those patrons was such an arrogant, brazen man that the priest was not able to do anything that gained his approval and constantly suffered from his abuse. Now, usually this noble brought his favorite big black dog with him to confession. Finally, he came up with the blasphemous idea to hold up the beast to the ear of the listening priest during the confession. He did so and whispered the deeds and pranks of the animal as if it were a human being, and the priest supposedly shook his head, but nevertheless gave that dog absolution. Well, after this, the noble broke out into maddened laughter, <laughs> which rose in volume until it finally could no longer be distinguished from the howling of a dog. insane the noble was led away and lived like a dog from this moment crawled on all fours and ate from the same bowl as the dog <laughs> indeed even after his death which occurred soon after he was not freed from his curse for the local people claimed that heaven's just punishment transformed him into a gigantic black poodle with the eyes of hellfire this black poodle shows itself to blasphemous people who visit the pub and never the church when they return home from their carousing at midnight. So there we see the first indications that sort of black dogs are supposed to be representations of, of evil. Like, you can make the case that there's sort of a curse going on with the ghostly poodle. We have no idea what's going on with the other two stories of the poodle. But this is the first indication we get of the dog being um, devilish in nature. And we're going to put that to the side for a moment. But I will say that is the main thing that black dogs represent in most folklore, but in, particularly, in particular German folklore. These hellfire eyes black dogs usually a poodle not necessarily <clears throat> but usually a poodle that roam the countryside or do strange things at your window were often either evil spirits or the devil himself 
But we're going to look at some sillier ones first. And the first one we're going to look at is called The Club Dog. And uh, it's a story named in that grand tradition of straightforwardness that the German language is known for. <coughs> Pardon me. This feels like a windy tale. Our next story is called The Club Dog, which is a reference to a club, not a club. And it comes to us again from Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles, translations by Jürgen Hubert. In many towns along the Rua River, there, as well as in other areas of Westphalia, Many people may chance upon a large dog, which is called the Knupurun, or club dog, because of the large club it wears around its neck. However, the dog harms no one as long as no one bothers it. In the city of Shiviata, there is also a dog of this type who runs through the streets from 10 o'clock in the morning uh, sorry, from 10 o'clock in the evening until the break of dawn. Once several people were busy threshing grain at night in the vicinity of this mowing route, and suddenly they heard something rustling in front of the door, as if the d club dog was walking slowly past. One of the threshers, who was relying on the fact that the lower barn door was locked, called out through the keyhole. Club dog, where are you going? But then the animal became enraged. Its fur bristled, and it became larger and quickly grew to such a size that it was able to put its front paws on the top of the barn door almost immediately. And when everyone inside ran away in panic and fled into a chamber on the upper floor of the house, well, what did it matter? <laughs> because the animal became larger still and put its feet into the window of the chamber and looked through the window panes with glowing eyes. And when it saw the fear of the inhabitants, it did not harm anyone, but left in peace after a while. Like I said, these stories are particularly ungrounded. Uh, like they don't, they really don't want to tell you what's going on. Carrying on from that confusing story about a dog with a club around its neck that seems to never factor into the story at all. The next story is almost the same idea, but equally unexplained. Our next tale is called The Jingle Dog. It also comes from Jürgen's collection. And, uh, it takes a similar form as the previous one. Many people from the village of Leuvenhagen and the surrounding lands have claimed to see the so-called Klimperhund. First, the observers hear the bell which the dog wears around its neck from a distance. Then the dog comes closer and runs past the observers to a hill in the area where it sits down and it wails pitifully. And does so for some time. But then at last, runs off into another direction and finally vanishes. It appears first to those who are most afraid of it, but it is not, so far as we can tell, malevolent. Well, a wealthy farmer at Leuvenhagen had raised a calf once 
He was astonished to see the calf walking around the yard at dusk, so he called his people and they attempted to bring the calf back into the stable. But how they were astonished when suddenly they heard the sound of a small bell. Ding, 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 ding. And it was the Jingle Dog. Another time, three men prepared hay on a meadow, and in the evening they had arranged the hay into hay stacks, for they feared that a thunderstorm might arrive overnight. By random chance, they talked about the Jingle Dog when they heard the well-known bell in the distance. To protect themselves from the dog, they hid in the haystacks. And when the dog approached, it went to each of the haystacks and looked at the man inside with large eyes. But then it ran off to its hill where it howled again and vanished. Finally, one woman had picked cabbage from the field when she wanted to cross a footbridge with her garb. The jingle dog arrived and ran straight through her, but without touching her or harming her in any way. And so in this story, obviously, we get less of a malicious or evil spirit, though it is menacing. We just get a strange spirit with no real explanation for why it exists. So, so far we've seen specifically strange poodles, and then we've seen a person turned into a poodle for their blasphemy. And now we've seen this theme of uh, a trope around dogs, again, probably poodles, um, wearing strange things around their collars and seeming to be ghosts. Are great beasts or spirits of some sort. Um, the idea, though, that the animal gets larger when you interact with it is a common trope, but usually what prompts that is various forms of animal abuse, which is tremendously common in folklore. And it's interesting because the majority of the time animal abuse results in bad things. But it's so naturally stated as if that would be the thing to do that one has to wonder if it really was that typical to see that kind of behavior. I mean, regards for animals has changed in, based on cultures and time over the years, but we'll see. <clears throat> and so our next stories, after I get a drink of water, are about sort of spirits that people are trying to be abusive to and uh, see comeuppance or, or terrible results for. Our next story is called The Yellow Dog, and it also comes from Jürgen Hubert's Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles. Now, each night, between 11 and 12 o'clock, there is a small yellow dog that can be seen on the roads between Zurigen and Gobslin. Goblins. This dog barked at passers-by, but otherwise does not harm anyone. And once the local forester also walked along this road at night, accompanied by his own dog, the forester had never heard of this particular dog before, however. And he spotted it nearby, big and yellow, strange. So the dog struck him as quite peculiar. And he aimed his rifle and attempted to shoot it. He missed, even though his target was very close. Normally a good shot, he was. But now, that yellow dog went after the huntsman. The latter realized this was no ordinary dog, threw his rifle away, and ran away hurriedly. His own dog ran after him and huddled against him while... <laughs> whining fearfully, and at full run, he reached the pub in Goblins. 
Well, the innkeeper hurriedly barred the door after the forester when he saw the latter race into the chamber in such a state of distress. And at this moment, the clock struck twelve. And an enormous crack was audible outside as if a cannon had been shot. Since then, the dog has not appeared to anyone else. Next time somebody is like, folklore is about passing on lessons to young people. Why don't you bring up this story? Because <laughs> what is the point of this story? <laughs> At first, it seems like don't shoot dogs that you don't know. But then what? What did it do? It just it shoot. It explodes. <laughs> It's a fun story is my point, but it doesn't necessarily mean much. <clears throat> Our next is a, a, a collection of little tales, very short, but they, they do tie themselves to the, the theme here, which is um, don't attack dogs <laughs> and other animals. Um, before we get to our final story of the night, which will be about the most prominent role that black dogs usually play in German folklore, which is either being the devil or guarding treasure or both. But this story is still about sort of vengeance for animal abuse. Well, there are a couple of little stories here. <clears throat> Let's go back to a little bit of light rain. This story is a collection of little short snippets of folklore called Ghosts in the Shape of a Dog from, again, Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles, translations by Jürgen Hubert. At night, a large black dog roams the area near the river Lime at Oldendorf. This dog has glowing eyes that are as large as symbols. The locals call him Fischund, or fishing dog, because he used to be a fisherman who, as he was lying on his deathbed, wished to fish forever after his death. Once, a man from Oldendorf wanted to walk to Hortenstein, Hortensen, sorry, at night in order to visit his bride there, and there he encountered the fish hunt on the church road. So he swung his stick at it, and then the dog rose up on its hind legs, stood tall, and gave such a mighty slap across the ear that the man fell down to the ground unconscious. And from this frightful experience, the man first fell sick and then succumbed to madness. The second tale was about a senior forestry official named Molf, allegedly built the salt works in Zalbeck. His portrait hangs within the entrance hall of the senior inspector's official residence. But the picture is the point here. For you see, if the picture is taken away from there, he would haunt this place. But as long as it remains there, a large black dog, as large as cattle, haunts the area instead. This dog walks up and down the Zalzgraben channel <clears throat> in the evenings. Once, young men from Zulbeck encountered it, believing it to be an ordinary dog. They threw stones at it. Don't throw stones at dog, even if it was. Don't do that. Especially don't do it to this dog. For when they threw stones at it, 
the dog stuck out its large, glowing tongue, and its fiery eyes became bigger and bigger, and now fear and dread overcame the young men, and they fled into a nearby house in wild flight, and quickly locked the door behind them. And as soon as they had done so, the dog was in front of the door and roared like a lion. Now, a carpenter from Zulbeck once went outside at night with several others in order to steal some fruits. He was about to leave with his loot when he saw the dog on his path at the fence, pacing, putting its front paws on the small pedestrian bridge. Well, as the man needed to cross the bridge, he spoke to the dog. Satan! Be gone! And tried to hit it. I don't know about you, but if I thought it was Satan, maybe I wouldn't try to hit it. Indeed, he shouldn't have, because he didn't connect with his swing and merely hit the empty air. In the same moment, he received such a mighty slap that he ended up on the other side of the Sal's grab and appeared to be dead for almost half an hour. The other people, who counted a barber among their numbers, remember barbers were sort of like low-grade medics? Doctor would be too strong back in these days. Finally managed to revive him and led him home. If you didn't know that, by the way. Now our final story about this particular dog is in, <clears throat> well, maybe a different dog, but in this collection, is in Bis Bishausen. A button maker died who had been an evil man while alive. And after his death, a large black dog with glowing eyes and a glowing tongue was lying in the front of the door of his former house, but only between 11 and 12 o'clock frightening passerbys through its countenance. This persisted for four weeks, and it was only after the priest had blessed the whole house that the, did the dog vanish. Imagine being so evil that a priest has to bless your own house to make it livable again. We don't know what he did, Honestly, coming back as a horrible, cruel dog sounds kind of badass. Doesn't sound like a punishment, does it? Especially not if you were already kind of evil. <clears throat> I guess it's always supposed to be like you don't get to go to heaven. Now, one thing I want to add here before I move on to our final story of the night is this first part of the story, the, the, fish hunt, the fishing dog. Uh, this line here, the this used to be a fisherman who, as he was lying on his deathbed, wished to fish forever after his death, is also a very similar account to Frau Gauden, who um, is a version of the wild hunt that I discussed back in December. But if you look at the Fireside Fairy Tales uh, playlist, uh, I think it's called It's Not Christmas Until Odin Raids the Countryside or something. Um <clears throat> which is all about different accounts of, I believe it's Northern Germany, but I don't know, um, different regions of Germany uh, talking about the wild hunt, which is not just a German thing, by the way. The trope of the wild hunt comes up in Norse myth, and uh, I think it's even in Scottish lore uh, it's to some extent. Not much, though. Uh, it comes up in lots of different places, is the point. But... Uh, in the case of Frau Gauden, at least one account of her, who is sort of the, the female version of the Wild Hunt, um, she says she doesn't want heaven. She wants to continue her hunt forever. And all her daughters um, agree and turn to hounds, and she has to ride upon a storm hunting forever. Which, I gotta be honest, sounds tremendously badass. 
<laughs> I worked her into uh, a D&D game of mine. Um, but I won't go into that now. <clears throat> Anyways. Uh, I find it interesting that that recurs here. Oops. Which means that we need to go to our final story of the night. And our final story of the night is the most story. Like, these were sort of folklore and urban legends. The last story of the night is an actual story. It is a grim story. Um, if you're not a huge fan of sort of darker things or woman being treated unfairly and cruelly, um, you might want to jump ahead for this one. I do think it's a good story. I do think it's a cruel and sad story, though. Tragic might be the word, but I think cruel is the better one. Um, however, it does fit with something that you might get the wrong impression about tonight, which is, I'm only reading one sample of this, but this is very common. Big black dogs strongly implied to either be the devil or in league with the devil who guard treasure. Um, dogs often are seen to guard treasure. And I find it interesting, by the way, a sort of version of this exists in uh, the game breath of the wild which is this is art of um uh a, a legend of zelda video game uh if you feed a dog a dog will lead you to treasure and i feel like that's a version of this but i don't know it is a japanese game but it is a japanese game that tends to draw a lot from japanese lore but also european lore and is told in sort of folklore fairy tale style <clears throat> Anyways, also has a sequel coming out at the end of the week, at which point I will disappear from the world. Um, so, this story is called Princess Swinwith, which is a translation from Jürgen Hubert in his collection Sunken Castles, Evil Poodles. And it is our final but most complete story of the night about a treasure guarding dog. Well... It's about a princess, but the dog comes to matter. There is a lake near the city of Gotts on Ruin Island. A castle used to be next to this lake. And when this castle was taken by the Christians many years ago, an old heathen king had been living there. This king had been very rich and was so miserly that he always slept next to his treasures of gold and gems, which he'd piled up in a large hall deep beneath the castle. He burrowed through these treasures day and night, like Scrooge McDuck. And during the destruction of that heathen castle by the Christians, you can see the biases here, he was buried so that he just died miserably of starvation. As his soul could not part from his terrestrial possessions, he was subsequently transformed into a black dog, which now has to guard the heaps of gold forever. At times, people see him in his human form, wearing helmet and armor, and in this manner, he rides over the city on a pale horse. And he rides that pale horse across the glassy mirror lake. And sometimes he wears a golden crown instead of a helmet while well seen in this manner. And others have seen him at night within the Gotzerholtz woods on the road to Poseritz where he wandered around with a black bobble hat on his head and a white stick in his hand. Our story is not quite about the old heathen king riding a pale horse or being a black dog buried with his treasures. Instead, our story is about Princess Swenwith. And in particular, what her story can tell us about how this old heathen king can be released from his existence. You see, once 
A king lived in the town of Bergen on Ruin Island who had a beautiful daughter named Swanleth. Many, many foreign princesses visited her. Of course, they wanted to court her. But she wanted none of them except a princess from Denmark, who was a noble, well-groomed man, and well-grown man, and whom she liked considerably more than every other suitor who had crossed her door. He thus became her betrothed groom, and the wedding was planned for the near future. But a Polish prince who had been among her suitors was very upset about this because he had a spiteful, malicious character. He spread rumors that the princess led an unchast life and that she had spent quite a few nights in his company. He knew how to make these tales so believable that everyone just trusted his words and one suitor after another rode away until finally her beloved prince of denmark likewise no longer wanted to hear anything about the engagement the fine tale finally reached the king and he believed it just like everyone else because every king in these stories is an idiot. <clears throat> That's not in the story. You should just know. <laughs> and became so enraged that he beat the princess, tore off her hair, locked her into a dark tower so that she would never pass in front of his eyes again. In this tower, the princess lived more than three years. and worried and tortured herself in vain while contemplating how to prove her innocence to her father. And it was then that she remembered the tale of that old heathen king and how he might be released from his turmoil for he could only be released when a pure maiden, a virginal maiden, in other words, would have the courage to climb the old castle ruins at Gotzer Sea Lake during St. John's night between 12 and 1 o'clock while being alone and completely nude. Then she would have to walk back and forth backwards until she stepped precisely on the spot where the door and stairs down to the treasure chamber of the old king were buried during the destruction of the castle. Then she would glide down without harm and she would be able to take as much gold and gems as she was able to carry and go back outside at dawn if she were pure. Whatever she would not be able to carry herself, the old king would carry after her so that she would have enough money and possessions for the rest of her life. But during the entire venture, she must not turn around a single time and she must not speak a single word either for otherwise she would not succeed and instead die a pitiful death. And the same fate would await her if she wasn't a chaste maiden. So the princess, Swenwith, remembered this in her lonely prison, and she contemplated embarking on this daring venture in order to prove her to her father and the whole world that she was pure, innocent, chaste, and that the malicious Pole had lied to them all. No.
I just like these old grievances that come up in folk tales. <clears throat> she thus had her plans reported to her father and asked him for permission to pursue them, and he granted her that permission. When St. John's night arrived, the princess walked alone from Bergen to Gotts, and when the church tower clock struck midnight, she took off her clothes and stepped into the castle ruins, where she now walked backwards and forwards while touching the ground with a dousing rod. I like that that was added. <laughs> Which she had equipped herself with. She didn't have to proceed in this manner for long when the earth opened up. She glided gently and slowly into the depths. There, she reached a large hall in which more than a thousand lights were burning, which was completely filled with large heaps of silver, gold, and gems. As she stepped forward to this large hall, she saw in a distant corner the king was sitting and guarding all his treasures. And there was a small gray man. Yeah, sorry, he was a small gray man who waved her at her in order to encourage her. But she was unafraid and merely greeted the king silently with her hand. Then suddenly, many splendidly dressed servants and maidservants appeared and they filled their hands with gold and gems and the princess did likewise and when she had gathered enough she embarked on her way back and all the servants and maid servants followed her as she had already walked many steps upstairs she all of a sudden became worried whether all those carrying the treasures were really following her she thus turned around to look at them but this was her great doom for suddenly the king transformed into a big black dog who jumped towards her with fury in his throat and glowing eyes and as she cried out oh lord jesus out of fear and dread the door above her closed shut With a loud bang and the stairs sunk down and she fell into that large hall where the lights instantly winked out well she now has been sitting inside this hall for many centuries pacing around in the dark and helping the old heathen king guard his treasures and she can only be released if a pure bachelor dares to climb the castle rooms of Goths in the St. John's night in the same manner as she did, then falls down into the treasure chamber. He must bow before her three times and kiss her and lead her outside by her hand. He may not speak a single word. Whoever brings her outside shall become her groom and attain so many treasures that he can buy an entire kingdom. Now you might ask yourself, well, surely many must have tried. And you would be right, many have. But none, not one, ever returned. It is claimed that that old black dog is so terrible to behold that everyone who has perceived it has cried out loud from the dread of it. And then everything is lost, for they cannot speak. The last man who 
who was allegedly entered the castle ruins was a shoemaker named Joachim Fritz. Joachim? He was of a young, handsome type and was always walking around the castle ruins, but suddenly he vanished. No one has ever learned where he went, had gone. His parents and friends and people searched for him in the entire world, but did not find him. And he might very well be sitting down there with all the others and that big black dog. That is the last story of the night, but it's not the end of the episode because we are going to read some translator's notes and I'm going to read a little bit of chat. But if this is where you jump off, thank you very much for coming by. And please consider giving us a like and consider giving me a subscribe or telling a friend if you think they'll enjoy it. Those are the things that really help. If you want to go a little step further or you have the ability to, I do have a Ko-Fi link down there. It's pronounced Ko-Fi, but most people are coffee, really. We're going to read it as Ko-Fi, uh, which helps me cover some of the costs, because there are indeed costs in this. But you don't have to do that if you can't. Um, GS has been talking, and I've been trying to get through these, so I haven't been looking. But GS says, thank you, Jurgen, for translating these poodle folk tales, because how else would we ever hear of them? I certainly never have, and thank you for reading them and sharing them with us. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea. It's a, to keep stories circulating uh, the idea of a translator's job and the idea of my a show here um gs says uh go yellow for the dog that attacked the person who tried to shoot him um and gs also has one wonders if stray dogs bred with wolves and were a potential threat to those walking about at night i don't even think they need to breed with wolves like if you would go to places that are don't have like as much structure around stray dogs where dogs can just sort of form packs in the street. Dogs can be pretty scary. <clears throat> um, okay. Let me clear out the weather. Turn up my fireplace a little bit. Uh, so now is the time of the show where I read you some translator's notes. Translator's Notes is the part of the show where I read comments that I get from the translators of my stories that I read, uh, usually from a previous video. In this case, this is from a video last week, which did quite well, by the way. Uh, if you came in from that, uh, that is super cool. I got quite a few subscribers off uh, that video. It's a Faust. Uh, it's about Faust, but it's also just about people taking deals with devils that is a topic i will be returning to i'm not doing it right now because jurgen is working on a book about that right now and i would prefer to line it up with jurgen's book release <clears throat> um so i'm saving those stories about the devil they're a good portion of the stories in this collection are about the devil um <clears throat> so translators notes and i'm leaving up this screen so that you know it's not my words is where i read that comment so the following words come from Jürgen Hubert, who translated tonight's tales and the tales last week. And this comment concerns the tales last week, which were about Faust. Great episode, as usual. Some comments. German folklore has all sorts of methods to get vehicles traveling through the air. But hitting a church tower on the way is traditional. Part of the reason that may be... Uh, part of the reason may be that church towers were, and often still are, the tallest building within a community. <clears throat> but it might also symbolize that such flight is contrary to God's will. And just a note from me, when I fly, I feel like I must have upset God, because it sort of feels like damnation. <clears throat> Back to his comment. Um... Illusory meals are also a staple of witches' gatherings, as I discuss in my latest Walpurgis Night special. Uh, latest translation, I should say. I do plan to eventually delve into the Klabauterman legends. Uh, they are basically shipboard spirits akin to the household spirits on land and invisibly take care of the ship and punish sailors who slacken off. Some interpretations claim that they are the spirit of a child who becomes magically bound to the wood used to build the ship. That's interesting. I am definitely looking forward to that. The Smith of Mitterbach, which I said I thought was the... Wait, let me 
being confusing here. Uh, it's a story. It's the last story I read last week. I said I think it was the best story in the collection that he had translated, and um, I still think it it probably is one of the best stories I ever read. So, uh, for the show, the Smith of Mitterbach is the very first tale I translated, and I am still highly fond of it. But I've since discovered that this type of tale is not that unusual after all. The devil traditionally has a lot of trouble with smiths. And the Smith and the Devil motif is so common it has its own Wikipedia entry. I have also encountered a variant where the curly hair that he asked the Devil to hammer out is not from the head. Don't think too long on that. Regarding bread. Usually people in the countryside bake bread in communal ovens. Either in their own village or neighboring ones. There were, or was, a strict schedule when it was each family's turn to bake their bread for the next month. I've come across this concept in a few folk tales, but my father still has memories of this approach from his own childhood. Which is wild. Um, we had uh, talked last week about how uh, we take for granted how tricky and complex and expensive ovens were uh, to have for most of human history, and as a result, bakers were often central to the community because they basically served as the only thing that could bake. And, uh, but I was sort of referring to a city center model. Uh, and what Jürgen is adding here is that even when uh, a baker is not present necessarily, families sort of, as far if I'm reading this correctly, scheduled time uh, when they were allowed to bake their monthly bread. <clears throat> And of course, bread is very important to survival above certain latitudes and in certain regions uh, because, you know, it's high density calories uh, from a grain that could be grown in places like, you know, Germany and whatever. But it, it is, to, uh, to my understanding, a kind of hangover from the Romans uh, who brought a lot of that up from sort of the Middle East and Egypt and so on. Um <clears throat> It was a way to survive in a place that has long, cold winters and not a lot of food, uh, but not the only way. And I also wanted to, the reason why I pointed out last week, by the way, I made a, a thing about mentioning that bread is not the staple the world over. It is a common thing, but it's not a staple the world over is because bread has unfortunately often been linked to colonial imperialist exercises where they will show up and tell people actually they're doing it wrong. They need to grow wheat and make bread when they didn't need to do that they had other things whether it was you know uh, certain root vegetables or rice or you know there's lots of other things that serve the function that bread does for european cultures um <clears throat> and so i just i put that out there bread has all i'm really saying is that bread has an absolutely fascinating history whether it is sometimes attached to imperialism sometimes attached to the whole reason why you can survive um and uh, has a great long lineage to different farming methods. Bread is fascinating. Is it though to most people, Rory? I don't know. It is to me. And if you're sitting here watching folk tales on a Tuesday night, I imagine that these kinds of things probably interest you as well. You can't be that divergent from me. <laughs> um, but uh, that that concludes our translator's notes. That concludes our stories about dogs. By the way, there are quite a few more stories about dogs doing tremendous things or terrible things or scary things. I sort of curated some of these. And if you want to read the commentary that goes along with these or uh, the full selection of tales or get new tales every month for a couple of bucks, uh, Jürgen Hubert, not me, who translates these tales, has a Patreon, which I will link in a pinned comment below when we are not live. And that Patreon is something you should support because it is absolutely crucial to keeping stories moving around. And stories moving around is how you keep culture. And if you keep culture, you don't keep getting sequels to the same five stories. <laughs> there you go. I might be overplaying my hand here as to what some of my angle is, but um, there are a lot of stories out there. And uh, yeah, translators help us keep them alive. Uh, so consider supporting Jürgen Hubert on his Patreon. Beyond that, 
I will keep the fire stoked and warm. Thank you so much, GS, for coming along and being my audience. And if you're watching this later, thank you so much. Uh, do give a like and subscribe if, if that if feels appropriate to you. And otherwise, thank you so much for giving me your time and hanging out with me. I'll keep the fire warm. You have a good sleep. Mm -hmm.